All right, back in the wild. <laughs> That's really hot. Okay. All right, back in the uh, back in the '60s and '70s, which was uh, my day. Um, well, and, and yeah, um, you know, there were a number of uh, there were a number of preachers that liked to do their preaching coffee house style. So they would, you know, like uh, wouldn't be up on the podium, or if they would, they'd kick away the uh, the lecturing, and they would set aside, and they would do a kind of let's talk type of deal. And so today, um, we're going to do a little bit of that, just from the standpoint that Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and we're going to run into this kind of when we deal with... Uh, Proverbs as well, but Ecclesiastes chapter 7 has no real theme running through the whole thing that we can grab onto and extrapolate and pull out. So instead, what I want to do is I want to just go through it with you and allow you to feed back to me and let's share a little bit about what are some of the things that are being said here so we can move through this quickly. So Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And I'm going to be reading from a different version this morning. I'm going to be reading from the, uh, the message. And so it puts things in a little bit different perspective. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1. Good reputation is better than a fat bank account. Your death date tells more than your birth date. All right. What do you get from that? Yeah, Whitney Houston's deal, timely, huh? Okay. Heidi, uh, does that speak to you? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, in in the reputation of a uh, of a good name. You know, when I was uh, when I was a young man in uh, many many years ago, um, I had an opportunity to listen to a guy. That it was a work type deal, and he came in and he had started out as a GS, this is in the government now, so he had started out as a GS uh, 2, which is essentially where I started out. It was very rare to start that look, but he started out as a GS 2, and he was like a GS, he was executive, so he was, you know, like a 15 or a 16, he was way up there. And he was talking about understanding the dynamics of moving up inside of an organization and he coined a phrase that he called organizational book. Everybody has an organizational book and what you guys would call it is you would call it a person's rep. What is, what is your rep? And he said, if you want to succeed in an organization, then you need to understand that you have an organizational book, and you need to understand how to control that organizational book, and that's going to be what people think of you. What people think of you, what they say about you, how it is that you're perceived, so that you can fashion that to your advantage as you go through your career. I have an organizational book. I have a reputation. Um, you know, I won't elaborate a great deal, but I mean, James can tell you that even 10 years after I'm gone, there are still people in customer service, which is where I started out, that, uh, you know, how do I, I don't want it to sound the wrong way, but, you know, I, who are in awe of me. Yes, I do. I, well, in customer service, yes, I do. And there are still people who are in customer service who have been there long enough to remember me that uh, they, they, they are aware of that. So I have an organizational book. Now, the, question, the thing that is being stated here is, are you aware that you have a rep that you're developing? Most of you are young, but are you aware that you have a rep that you're developing? 
And, and what is that that people think about you? And is it a good rep? Or is it something that needs working on? You know, do they see you as somebody who's truthful and somebody who, you know, uh, you know, shares uh, truthfully or that, that lives in such a way or, you know, that's something, you know, again, we turn, go back to what happened with uh, Whitney Houston. How sad. You know, she, she used to be called the voice. In my day, she was the voice because she had a gorgeous, powerful voice. And then she married that idiot, and things just went downhill from there. And Bobby Brown basically destroyed her. Now, she made that choice. But he basically destroyed her, and she never recovered from that. How's that? Okay, so the, what's being said here is a good reputation. That's better than money in the bank. What is your rep? That's the first thing Solomon talks about. Okay, verse two. Let's read. Let's read on here. You learn more at a funeral. <laughs> yeah, cool. You learn more at a funeral than at a feast. After all, that's where we'll end up. We might discover. You might discover something from it. Crying is better than laughing. It uh, it blotches the face, but it scars the heart. Sages find themselves in hurt and grieving. Fools waste their lives in fun and games. You will get more from the rebuke of a sage than from the song and dance of fools. The giggles of fools are like the crackling of twigs under a cooking pot and like smoke. Brutality stupefies even the wise and destroys the strongest heart. What's this talking about? What happens at a funeral? We all going to attend funerals? You all are going to attend your own funeral, right? You kind of be there. <laughs> We're all going to, you know, at funerals, basically, it's a somber thing, isn't it? You're reflecting on a person's life. And what follows is that what Solomon is saying is even though, you know, when you get to the end of life or you get through the struggles of life, those are sobering things. They're not fun things, but they're sobering things. But do, do you learn more when you go through trials and tribulations? Have y'all experienced that? Adam, you experienced that, dude? Going through trials? Learn more? Yeah. yeah. Rather than somebody who just walks around giddy all the time? You remember in the 1990, was it in the 1990, I think it was the late 90s or early 2000s, it was like, you know, don't worry, be happy. Early 90s. Don't worry, be happy. Is it, is it really? Yeah, Bobby, yeah, yeah. 80s, really? Oh my goodness. It lasted even harder. Time flies. Wow. Yeah, the idea that, you know, be, don't worry, be happy, don't worry about life. Like, you know, uh, uh, you don't learn from those times. You learn from when you struggle. You learn from when you have to go through things. That's the message that Solomon is giving you. Not fun, nonetheless, better for you. Verse 8, endings are better than beginnings. Sticking to it is better than standing out. Yeah? You don't know the outcome until you go through it. How many people you need results? There's a true manager. How many, how many people do you know that start something and they never finish it? It's, there are some people just that are prone to that, but, but you know, it, it's saying persistence. 
Persistence. That's that's what you got to do. That's what you got to focus on. Be persistent. Hang in there for the long run. When I was, I think I told you this before. If I told you this before, forgive me. I'm aged and I, I repeat myself. Um, what you remember when the the um, promise keeper started? You remember hearing about the promise keepers? Some of you know about the promise keepers. Some of you are giving me the deer in the headlights look. <laughs> promise Keepers was an organization that started about 15 years ago. Oh my goodness, no, it's been more than that. It's been 25 years ago. Wow. Wow. Um, okay, so Promise Keepers was an organization that started about 25 years ago. And basically what it was, was it was, uh, it was predominantly run by the Catholic Church, but they didn't really say they were Catholic. And what they were doing is they would hold um, stadium events where they would encourage men to come to these stadium events and they would teach them things about, you know, learning how to be a man, which that's predominantly a good thing. But they would teach them things and, and so if you went to one of these events, you were a promise keeper because you had learned some things about, you know, how to be true to yourself and true to your woman and true to your children, true to your family, et cetera, et cetera. So it wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but there was this big push in the churches. And I remember this guy coming to me one time and talking to me about, you know, how come you didn't go to this thing? You know, he was all hyped about being a promise keeper. How come you didn't go to this thing? And, you know, we had this little discussion. And, you know, I said to him, I said... Um, you know, I was a promise keeper before this thing ever started. And my concern is this. Five years from now, ten years from now, are you going to remember and be able to implement all your things so that you're a promise keeper? Or is this just a sizzle in the frying pan? Is there anything really to it than it's just kind of an event? Because you see, I've been a promise keeper for a long time. I know how to take care, be faithful to God and take care of my family and keep my word and do all those things because that's what the word of God teaches. But this promise keeper thing, it just kind of over time has fizzled out. It was an event, an anomaly in the frying pan. Solomon is saying that we need to be consistent in how it is that we do things and persist all the way until the end. That's what I would encourage you all to do. Now, verse 9, don't be quick to fly off the handle. Anger boomerangs. You all familiar with the boomerang? Yeah, okay. You all know what it one is. I have one, a real one from Australia. You throw it the right way, and it goes out and comes back to you. Anger boomerangs. You can spot a fool by the lumps on his head. <laughs> you can spot a fool. Which means he didn't see that boomerang coming. Got anger, threw it out there, goes on his way, and boom, <clears throat> gets hit. You can see and know a fool by the lumps on his head. Verse 10. This doesn't apply to most of you. Because most of you don't have good old days. Chris, this would apply to you. James and Rose. James, possibly, you're right about it. It says here in verse 10, Don't always be asking, where are the good old days? Wise folks don't ask questions like that. What's it, what's it really saying? Don't live in the past. Very good. Because it's always better than you remember it to be. It's always better than you remember it to be. You don't remember how rough it was back then or back in the day. Don't do that is what it's saying here. Okay, here we go. Verse 11. Wisdom is better when it's paired with money, especially if you get both 
while you're still living. Double protection, wisdom and wealth, plus this bonus. Wisdom energizes its owner. Wisdom and money paired together. We talked about this last week. I won't, you know, elaborate very much except to say, if you got money, be wise with it. Didn't any of you sign up for the Powerball? Did you? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. 300, what was it? 340 million? It was 350? 350 million dollars. Remember what I told you last week? 80 to 85 percent of people who win millions within a five-year period are poppers again. Because you got to know how to spend the money that you have. Lucas made an excellent post this week. You mind if I repeat your post? Not a bad thing. Lucas made this post this week in regard to my message last week and basically said that money has to be coupled with responsibility. So you have to be financially wise. You have to have responsibility tied to how you handle your finances. And as believers, we're kind of torn, you know, because I want to trust in God to provide, but I also have responsibility to pay my bills, to invest my money correctly, to have money set aside for uh, disasters and what you do. I like Heidi this morning talking about she didn't want to cheat her employer. Yeah, some people wouldn't. <laughs> some people wouldn't get or wouldn't think that what you were talking about was important. But there's an ethic that's involved being responsible. And Heidi was saying, I, I'm not going to do that to my employer. When, uh, y'all remember, um, maybe you don't. I'm dating myself again. You remember when, uh, what's his name, who uh, who filed bankruptcy and, and uh, he said nothing, nothing, or freeze a very good price? Um, Tom, Tom, Peterson. Tom Peterson. You remember when, are y'all enough to remember when Tom Peterson and Glory well you know why you know why they say Glory too because the bankruptcy court required that to be a part of the settlement but you know what Tom Peterson supposedly was a believer he had, he attended a church regularly do you know what the records revealed about Tom Peterson is that before he filed bankruptcy he went out and ran up as much charges as he could because he knew that he was going to be filing bankruptcy. What's that called? Right. Cheating, stealing, it's theft. Right. The world might think so, and the world does think so. If you, if you wanted to, you know, if you go to a bank and you try to get, and you try to get your mortgage, well, not now probably, but, but most recently within the last year, if you went to a bank and tried to get your mortgage reduced and you had been paying your mortgage, what would the bank tell you? Stop making payments. Stop making payments. And then once you're in default, we can then poss possibly, Maybe we can then renegotiate your, uh, your deal. Now, of course, you realize that according to the contract that you signed, that if you fail to make payments, the bank has the right to foreclose and to take your house from you. They're obligated in no way whatsoever to renegotiate anything with you. And, of course, they don't promise that they're going to not report the fact that you're now delinquent to the credit agencies. And so you've just essentially screwed yourself. And that has happened across the board in the United States. <laughs> it's like, wow. We need to be smart about our finances. Oh, well, this is what scripture is talking about. And responsible. All right. We're almost...
13. Take a good look at God's work. Who could simplify and reduce creation's curves and lines to a straight line? On a good day, enjoy yourself. On a bad day, examine your conscience. God arranges for both kinds of days so that we won't take anything for granted. Stay in touch on both sides. You have good days? True? You have bad days where you can hardly... Anything goes right? You just think you should have stayed in bed? Because it's just one of those ugly, ugly days? Solomon says, take stock. Understand both. Don't just blow off the fact that you're having a bad day. Ask why you're having a bad day. Be thankful when you have good days. Hope that they balance out, is what Solomon is saying. Here are just some quick settings. 15. I've seen it all in my brief and pointless life here. A good person cut down in the middle of doing good. There is a bad person living a very long, evil life. So don't knock yourself out being good. And don't go overboard being wise. Believe me, you won't get anything out of it. But don't press your luck by being bad either. And don't be reckless. Why die needlessly? It's best to stay in touch with both sides of the issue. A person who fears God responsibly with all of reality, not just a piece of it. That's what we're called to do. When I was growing up, we had a saying for people. I had an uncle that um, he knew the Lord and he used to infuriate my parents because whenever he would visit, um, first of all, they always had a Bible. Chris inherited it. Um, and whenever he would come over, it didn't matter if it was a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or a sandwich or whatever. He always had to give this long involved prayer for what it was. And and he couldn't make a decision without first making an elaborate showing of praying. It's kind of an interesting character. My parents developed a saying, which they heard from someplace else, but I heard it growing up all the time. You remember what it was? Uh, so spiritually minded. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically they, they, they explained to us that my uncle was so spiritually minded, he was no earthly good. And you know, there are people like that. There are people that are so wise in and of themselves that they reek. You, you know, people like that. They're, just too, they're too smart for their own good. They think they know more than they do. Solomon is saying, don't be like that. Don't be like that. Have some balance. You see, what Solomon presents here in these verses is kind of the swing of the pendulum. He says there are people over here to the right that are really, really good and very wise and they do things just wonderful. And you shudder every time you get around them because you know that you're never going to measure up. And then there are people over here on the left that are just reek with evil. And he says, you kind of need to be in the middle. You need to be not so good 
that you don't realize that you're not really that great. And you don't need to be pursuing evil because evil has attached to it always the consequence of your actions. We go back to, you know, poor Whitney. I, she's not the only one. There are other people too. Karen Carpenter, probably the best female vocalist of the century. The century! The last hundred years. That girl had a fantastic voice. Be careful what you put about the girl, Josh, I'm telling you. <laughs> but, but Karen, you know, had this feeding disorder that she couldn't just get over. There were consequences, and even after she tried to deal with it, it killed her because she had ruined her body. Whitney hooked up with this idiot, Bobby Brown into heavy, heavy drugs experimentation, being radical in, in how he dealt with things, blowing off the authorities, doing whatever. Even after her family rescued her from that situation, she never overcame that. She was still tormented by the consequence of her drug use and her reputation, which she destroyed. There are consequences for doing things correctly, and there are consequences for not. We need to understand that. You all know that? There are consequences? <clears throat> John? Can you further elaborate on, because I think we can take the taxation to say that just because anyone is too good and treats those two people, which then implies that it's okay to and it's okay to not work up to a high standard. Yeah. How do you reconcile that? Well, personally, how I reconcile it is I... Uh, now, see, you're, you're baiting me in a, in a little bit because I, I struggle with Ecclesiastes. The, because here Solomon is presenting extremes. And the purpose of ex presenting the extremes is to understand that real life people live somewhere in the middle. Real life people live somewhere in the middle. And even you and I, as believers, we live somewhere in the middle. And really what I understand Solomon to be saying, and share with me if you think not, or you know, you want to elaborate, go ahead, Josh. But, but you know, Solomon, um, it, He's presenting these extremes. Real life people kind of live in the middle. And as believers, life is about learning how to make choices and how it is that we do things. And understanding our world not within the perception of how the world sees things, but how God sees things. And so if you start out young, you make fewer choices that are poor. And so as believers, I think that the, the more that we come in line with what understanding God's perspective, the better choices we make. And that should be our goal. Our goal should be to conform to the image of Christ and to understand the world through the lens, as it were, of Scripture, and to make choices for how we're going to do things based upon that. But the reality is, is sometimes you're going to make mistakes. You're going to not be complete in what it is that you're pursuing. So you may make some poor choices. And I think that's what Solomon is saying here. Our, is that normal people live somewhere in the middle. But as believers, we need to learn God's perspective and learn how to make choices in such a way that we reflect God in our everyday choices. Rose, you want to add to that? Well, I was just thinking of, of what God said, and I think um, that the answer is no, that you don't need to be, you know, 
Is it okay to then be um, sinful or wicked to be? The answer is no. And I think uh, the way I, I uh, perceive the passages in 16 and, and 17 is about consequences. Because if you are excessively righteous and wise, uh, we know that those people like that can ruin themselves. And if you are wicked and a fool, you could die the consequences of your actions. So I think that, you know, uh, when you're talking about the balance, I think it has nothing to do with being wicked. I think it has nothing to do with being wicked. I think it's something to do with the choices you make. And, um, you know, nobody really wants to be with people that you can't, you can't talk to them yeah. unless they, they, they have this jargon, a Christian jargon. And so, you know, I agree with you that there is a balance and, you know, uh, just a statement that Josh said, I don't think that, you know, we, as a Christian, we need not pursue any form of evil. Yeah, I agree. Judge Court. <laughs> Thanks, Evan. What I always have is, especially like the message is great, but it is a it is a uh, paraphrase. But um, in the NLT it says, on the other hand, don't be too wicked either. And what I always have is, I think it's very clear. It's all in presenting a. It's don't be too good because then you're a certain way, but also don't be too wicked. So it's like okay for you to be wicked. And I think that is exactly what Paul is saying, especially if you consider the way he lived his life. But with that said, and then I think you're adding a Christian element, like a Christ centered element to it, now that we have a perspective of Christ. And I think if you read down, it says uh, in 18 pages, these instructions only work with fear of God or avoid both extremes. And as I read this, the thing that keeps popping into my mind is here you have a person who understands how things should be, but doesn't understand how things are. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I read it. I read it as somebody who's flippantly talking about flippantly talking about how nothing matters and how you can be good and you can be evil, and as long as you don't do too much of either, then you're going to have a decently long life. But I don't fear the fear of God in that. And that's, that's how I read it. I read it as somebody who's giving a practical explanation without actually having a, without actually having the Holy Spirit tempering his interpretation of it. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I would agree with you. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I struggle with uh, Ecclesiastes, because I, uh, you know, in the very beginning, Josh said that, you know, um, that Solomon was, was idiotic and how it is that he used his, widow, uh, his wisdom. And I'm in total agreement with that because I, I don't see how he could have lived the way he did um, having that wisdom there. With that said, I would not be true to you if I didn't say that as believers we have the Holy Spirit and we should have a different perspective on how to make the choices that we have before us. Yeah, and let me add that this is where I'm Pastor Dad expressed very briefly and maybe you got a bigger picture of it. He didn't really like the reaction. And that's the reason why he doesn't like the reaction. And I think this is one of those rare opportunities where from the pulpit to really yeah, where where we as a people get to struggle with a not so um, with a not so profound interpretation of the way that God works. Where you get to see, I mean, we get Paul, and Paul is good about saying this is my view, you know, um, and it's really you can see his advancement uh, or as a consumer. You can see his, yeah, I do that. You can see his, his sin nature, his less than perfect nature in how he works out in scripture. And I think that, I think that we as believers are called to look at these passages 
and see that there are so many different things that make sense there, but not stop there. And I think so many people will look at past moves and be like, oh, that didn't make sense, but I'll just gloss over it because you know, Pastor Dad said that it's his going over here. And though that may be true, and though you know, Christ, is, is, Christ gives a, a deeper perspective, it, it's important for us to recognize that something isn't lining up. Yeah. 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 Totally. Cool. Thanks, Josh. And let me just say that Rose brought up, and rightfully so, that when the Apostle Paul dealt with this issue of, because this does come up, but it comes up in a different context. Read Romans chapter five and six, where you know people have been saying, at least in the church at Rome, people in the church of Rome were saying, well, if I'm covered by the blood of Christ, then. <laughs> I do whatever I want because I'm covered by the blood of Christ. And Paul's way of dealing with that was to say, <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't you understand what happened when you were covered by the blood of Christ and the consequences, the follow through of that action and how your life should reflect that? So he brought them back to reality by snapping them back in and saying, no, no, you, evidently you have a misunderstanding of where you are positionally now because of the blood of Christ. And that's why I would throw in that element of as believers, we need to understand that we should be, we, we need to understand that, that real people, as I stated earlier, and you know, I didn't grow up in the church. I grew up in a very dysfunctional family. I understand real people. I understand how real people function. And that's why I can say that real people deal with this issue of living somewhere between those extremes. But as a believer, you know, we need to understand that we can live in such a way that we don't make poor choices. And that we should be gravitating towards that because of positionally where we are and who we are in Christ. Okay. Uh, verse 21. I'm sure none of you do this. But if you happen to be meeting at Denny's, for example, you can't tell them. Don't eavesdrop on the conversation of others. The elders the other night were sitting and talking about some various things. And, you know, nothing secretive or anything like that. But we were talking about putting finishing touches on the room upstairs and some of the work that had to be done. And there was this couple on the other side of us who were obviously eavesdropping because they the guy was kind of weird and and he took time to stop and he asked us where we were from and then he told us that really what we should be doing is putting any money that we have um, available um, towards helping dogs yeah, dogs. You know, like like pit bulls and what have you. Because his thing was dogs, evidently. And, you know, the three of us just looked at each other and went, okay, okay. <laughs> it, was, it was very, okay. Don't eavesdrop on the conversation of others. What if the gossip's about you and you'd rather not hear it? Um, you've done the same things many times, haven't you? Said things behind somebody's back that you wouldn't say to their face? Solomon says, don't do that. Okay, enough said. Interpreting the meaning of life. Listen, this is very deep. I, this section I really like. I'm being ironic. I tested everything in my search for wisdom, and I set out to be wise, but it was beyond me. He's being truthful here. He just didn't grasp it. Far beyond me, and deep, oh, deep so. Does anybody really ever find it? I concentrated with all my might, studying and exploring and seeking, 
wisdom in the meaning of life. I also wanted to identify evil and stupidity and foolishness and craziness. So in 23 through 25, he makes a statement that this is really what his life was all about, was trying to discover what life really is all about, okay? Now, look at verse 25. Um, one discovery, I, I made a discovery when I was finding out about the meaning of life and evil and foolishness and what have you. Ladies, don't take offense to this. I didn't write it. We're just talking about it, okay? One discovery I made, a woman can be a bitter pill to swallow, full of seductive scheming and grasping. The lucky escape her. The undiscerning get caught. At least this is my experience, what I the quester have pieced together as I've tried to make sense of life. But the wisdom I've looked for, I haven't found. I haven't found one man or woman in a thousand worth my while. Yet I did spot one ray of light in this murk. God made men and women true and upright. We're the ones you, that have made a mess of things. Who are the ones who have made a mess of things? Um, how many wives did Solomon have? He had something like, in John is right, I think it's somewhere around the 600 number, and he then, on top of that, had a thousand concubines. 333 concubines? Oh, well, I tripled it, I'm sorry. So it was a thousand, yeah. So, so he blamed his misunderstanding of life upon all these women that he surrounded himself with. Wow. Wow. Now, well, my take on this, I'm just going to go back to the biblical understanding. My take on this, and it is my opinion, that this is the reason why in the New Testament we emphasize having only one woman per man. So that you can keep things in better perspective. We're the ones who screw things up. We're the ones who make things difficult. God's word doesn't. We can always trust in God's word. We can always allow God's word to guide us. And that's where we need to place our focus. So with that said, what, uh, what do we learn from these passages this morning? Well, a couple of things. What have you learned this morning? Share with me. What do these passages say to you? Well, I'll just pick one or two that speak to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Money can't save you. Wisdom can. Money has its place, but you got to be responsible with it. Okay. Try to maintain that tension. There is a there is a dynamic tension that's always there. Try to maintain that tension. Who do we have to help us do that? The Holy Spirit. And men, if you're married, who do you have to help you do that? <laughs> yes. It's not your wife's job to to remake you or keep you humble. What else do you learn? How to respond to trials. Be persistent. What's with what what is what is added to the persistence? Consistence. Persistent and consistent. Do you know one of the reasons why the uh, you know one of the reasons why employers like to uh, to hire people that have uh, college degrees? 
Yeah, it's not because they're smart. It's discipline. It's persistence. Is that they started something and they finished it to the end. That's really what they don't care about what your degree is in a lot of times. You, fewer, few, this is really true. Fewer than 20% of people who graduate and have college degrees work in the actual field of their degree. What they're looking for is not the fact that you have uh, that, that you're in a particular area, what they're looking for is that you've had the persistence to start something and to finish it. That's what they're after. Okay, so a lot of different things that you can grab onto this week and you can talk about um, as you, as you uh, develop your threads. And so we're going to be looking for discussion about how does this really affect you and how um, does it work in your life? Where are you at? We, I pray that as you think about this this week, that you'll be thinking about, you know, what does it mean for you personally? That's how you can turn it around and say, okay, what do I take from this? Do you have issues with being consistent? Do you have issues with finance? Are you so giddy that you're just not sober at all? People perceive you as giddy. Do you, do you have a plan for your life? You know why employers like to ask you what you're going to be in five years or where you're going to be in five years? They want to know if you have a goal, if you have a plan for where you're going, or are you just kind of meandering through life? Those are the types of questions that, you're because you're young, you need to ask yourself. And more importantly, that goes not only for the physical. We talked a little bit about the physical when you talk about money, good reputation, those types of things. But it also goes for the spiritual. Where do you want to be five years from now spiritually? How mature do you want to be? I've known people that have accepted Christ and known the Lord for years. And the only thing that they've done when they come to church is wear their mark in the pew. They're still babies, toddlers, because they've never grown spiritually. Where do you want to be spiritually? And what do you need to do in order to get there? Those are the types of questions that we're looking at as we look at what's being presented by Solomon. All right, cool. Let's close in a word of prayer. A lot of activities going on this week. Pray God's blessing upon you and that, uh, and that you're able to accomplish uh, those things this week. Stand with me in this club. Father, thank you for this time that we've set aside to worship you, to praise you, Lord, to lift up your name, and to try to learn how it is that we can honor you and how it is that we live. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to gain some understanding from where Solomon is coming from. Lord, that we might be able to take some of these uh, words that, uh, that are wise, and uh, apply them practically in our lives. Above all, Lord, help us to understand that we are your ambassadors, Father, that we've been set aside by the blood of Christ, and that we represent you and your church here on earth until you come for us, Lord. Please, Lord, come quickly. We pray that you would be with us as we go out one from another, that you would bless us in our activities of this week, that you would protect us as we go out, bring us back safely together, that we might glorify you through all that we do this week. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ I pray. Amen. And may God be with you. So go ahead and stick around. We have a raffle. We're going to do it in here. We want to have you guys come to